Hey, Donka, what would you do with $120,000? Down payment on a house, maybe some new shirts. That's sensible. You are You're watching, watching Best of Three. <laughs> awesome. Intense. Welcome to Best of Three, our weekly FGC talk show brought to you by The Daily Dot, shot in our studio here in Austin, Texas. We're really excited about today because not only are we riding that wave of hype from the Capcom Cup, but we have one of those guys that made it further than anybody expected. Please join us in welcoming Keoma Pacheco. Keoma, are you there? Yeah, here I am. Hey, Keoma, nice how's it going, man? Uh, did you just well, get back into great. Brazil or how long have you been home? Oh, I've been home for like 12 hours for now. You know, Keoma, uh, I think even you, Mike, were saying that like, you were just so surprised at, at, at how far this guy went. I, I was surprising like before the tournament, but once he started playing, you know, it, got, it seemed pretty obvious he was going to do well. The, the, that idea that people didn't expect you to make it far, how do you feel about that, Keoma? Uh, that's, that's what, uh, that was like a, sort of my, my expectations also. Uh, the, the, the tournament is like so stacked. Uh, 32 of the best players in the world. Everybody can get O2, you know, even Daigo could. So I was like, I, I just want, I just don't want to get O2. That was actually the main focus, to be honest. So, so you say that your main focus wasn't to get O2, but when, say, Haitani came to the Brazilian tournament to, to take it, to go to Capcom Cup, what was your feelings in your hometown about, you know, defending the tournament and making it to Capcom Cup yourself? Um, I didn't think too much about defending the turf, to be honest. Uh, I was just excited to, to be able to play uh, such a high-skilled player as Haitani. Uh, so when I heard he was coming to Brazil, I was like, oh, I got to study the Makoto matchup because I, I want to beat this guy. And Keoma, uh, how did it feel, first of all, uh, for Brazil to be represented, uh, especially with a premier event as it was, uh, how does that feel to have that kind of uh, attention and presence put on to your community? To, to the degree that you're like, oh, hey, Tony's going to be here, I better prepare. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what that meant for Brazil and for you. Uh, well, uh, actually, the, the whole uh, Brazilian FGC uh, tried to prepare for both Haitani and Pepedai. So uh, when it comes to, to foreign players coming to, to our country, we actually try a lot harder to, to defend the turf. So... Uh, the FGC in Brazil got way more united than it used to be for preparing it to those two guys. So you mentioned before the show that people in Brazil tend to live very far apart and it's hard to prepare. A lot of people have been wondering how you got so good with such a separated scene and how you study matchups like, you know, the Makoto matchup for Haitani if you don't have players near you. Uh, we actually had, uh, we have uh, uh, two strong Makoto players around here and... Uh, Basically, it's all about online gaming in Brazil. Uh, we don't have, uh, we don't usually meet very often. So unless there's a like a, a major tournament, which is gonna be like a once in a year for Brazil, uh, there's no way to practice the matchup except for online. And it's it's really laggy, but we get to to study the matchups based on uh, some footage of the players themselves. Like uh, if I if I'm gonna play Makoto uh, Haitani. Uh, of course, I'm going to be watching some Haitani videos, you know. Um, and based on uh, feedback from the, the uh, Makoto players around here, uh, we could figure out uh, something to do, some game plan. So uh, also, uh, online gaming might be bad, but since we have the access to stuff like frame data, uh, all those videos, uh, it becomes easier to, to learn the matchups. But do you think that you're at a disadvantage, though? I mean, you're saying that you don't have all the resources around you. You're playing laggy internet and studying videos as opposed to, you know, a dedicated, I'm surrounded by character specialists and I'm leveling up. Do you think you're at a disadvantage? And how do you square that with how far you made it in, into the season and then at the Capcom Cup? Uh, the thing is, um, of course, we have a disadvantage, but I never, I never let that uh, discourage me when I'm playing. So... I try to think as uh, as much as I can about any matchup uh, to to get the answers for some specific situations. So even if we don't have the matchup knowledge, we could try to uh, imagine things and try to put things in, into practice, uh, uh, even if it's like once in a year. So for Capcom, one so of the guys were like, "Oh, why don't you go to DreamHack instead?" And that's how it was. 
since I since everybody agreed, uh, we just uh, made preparations for DreamHack, and then the, uh, the guys in France, uh, Flo Sama, uh, he invited me for SGB, and I got so excited about it. I, I just got some extra money and went for it. You know, because after CPT Brazil, it was obvious that I needed some uh, international experience, which I got, and I was. I'm pretty happy it worked well, out. Kelma, that's one of the things that we were talking about was, is a couple of weeks in Europe enough to, to be prepared? How much do you, I mean, talk to us about the impact that that, that, that amount of experience actually uh, uh, helped you with. Um, the European scene was actually so strong, uh, strong to the point uh, I was able to learn from my mistakes so quickly because they were punishing me so hard for all the stupid stuff I got. Uh, I tried to do so uh, that that made me tr uh, play way more safer than I used to. So uh, I, I I definitely own it to the to the European guys, you know, uh, Vaggy, who practiced the Zagif matchup with me in Europe, uh, Ryan Hart, uh, Problem Max, all those all those guys, you know, um, I, I owe them for that. Okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna transition into the actual Capcom Cup itself, but to kick us off. Tell me how it felt walking into that venue. We were seeing guys like James Chen tweeting pictures like, oh my God, I just saw the venue and, you know, I'm getting emotional about it. How did you feel walking into that stage? Um, I actually got uh, really nervous at first, uh, but this was the day before uh, when the, the conference were, were taking place, you know, the, the Final Fantasy VII remake and things like that. Uh, I was watching from there and I was like, oh, Capcom Cup is going to be here. This is going to be so exciting so insane i, I actually uh got way more exciting excited than nervous to be honest uh and now i was just thinking about oh uh, I, I just want to play 100 percent of what i'm capable of you know uh there wasn't um there wasn't actually much pressure uh on me to to perform well i was i just got too excited about it when i when i first saw the venue we have a question that somebody tweeted at us that says, "Did you train?" That asks, "Did you train with Edison the day before Capcom Cup?" Uh, exactly. Uh, actually, two days before Capcom Cup, uh, Tokido called me. Uh, he wanted to get some uh, able matchup knowledge, you know, able, able practice for his first match against Chiro. Uh, he also mentioned uh, Itabashi wanted to play, so I could get uh, a little bit more experience about the the Zangief matchup because of that. You know, speaking of that, um, let's get into it. Snake Eyes, you surprised quite a few people by taking them out that first match. Did Were you surprised? Uh, I actually was. To be honest, uh, it, it didn't feel like I was playing Snake Eyes. Uh, the way he played, uh, I, I didn't agree with most of the stuff he did. Uh, by playing Itazan uh, two days before uh, Snake Eyes, um, most of my mistakes were pr pretty clear, to be honest. Uh, and it, it is hard to, to, to keep yourself from making those mistakes. Uh, there are a couple of risks you, you need to take in that matchup. And since Itazan's with punishing is so good, I never, I never seen anything like that before. Uh, pressing any button in front of Itazan looked like a mistake. Uh, that gave me some perspective to play against Snake Eyes, but the thing about the first round matchup uh, is it was just like Snake couldn't get his stuff going. He wasn't too sure about what to do. Uh, you know, uh, I, I actually, when I got into match point, it was like, damn, what, what's going on? <laughs> this I, guy's I, free? I, <laughs> is that I what you're thinking? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't like this guy's free, but uh, I. I know he's under, underperforming, you know. He wasn't playing like I expected Snake Eyes to do. So I'm, I'm actually a fan of Snake Eyes. I, I watch a lot of his matches. Um, I, I really I really enjoy watching him play, uh, the patience he has, all that stuff. He didn't show, he didn't show uh, to be the, the Snake Eyes I'm a fan of in those matches, uh, that first round, you know. Um, I actually got pretty, pretty surprised by the way he played and, and not in a positive way, to be honest. You know, that's interesting. And you said you're a fan of Snake Eyes' play. You said that, you know, you didn't expect to do that well in the tournament. How did you feel going into Capcom Cup as one of the three able players? Are these people that you're also fans of? Have you learned from them? What was your perspective going in as, you know, like the third able player? 
Oh, about that. Uh, the Scoop Squad. A cool story. Yeah, the Scoop Squad story. Um, Shiro was like the after after Justin Wong. I, I play Able because I saw Justin Wong playing Able at first against Daigo at Evo 2009. Uh, after that, I got some uh, uh, some Able videos to to look to look for. Um, that was like uh, 2008. You know the uh, Daigo concept matches. I think it was in 2008 against uh, Shiro Abel. Uh, that's when I I knew about Shiro. I watched a lot of his footage, so I got to learn. I I, I really learned a lot from from uh, watching Shiro play since uh, Arcade Vanilla. Uh, as for Strider, uh, Strider is actually the reason I picked the third color for Abel because I thought the Rufus matchup was a nightmare. Back in 2010, the matchup was just so bad, you know. And he was playing so well against Ricky. And uh, I, I don't remember which tournament that was, but uh, he, he, he actually uh, defeated Juicebox to get into the grand finals and play against Ricky. Um, he was doing so well, and I was so inspired by his gameplay. You know, that was the first time I saw any able player do crouch tech fierce and things like that. And uh, I became a, uh, I instantly became a fan of Gustavo, and I started picking the the Abel's third card because of that. <laughs> so I mean, how did it, so you're saying that you're fans of these guys, and then you get to hang out with them, and and hell, even potentially do better than them? How does that he make you feel? did do better than them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, <mean. laughs> yeah um, I actually wasn't expecting. Uh, the thing about uh, the, the Scoop Squad at Capcom Cup, uh, it was too hard to to know. Um, if any, uh, any any of us would be able to to get uh, past first round, you know, Gustavo was uh, was meant to be to, to play against Kazunoko. And that is that is the probably the worst matchup for Abel right now. I feel like Yun is almost a two Yun's favorite you now. Uh, Shiro, he was about to play against Tokido, seven three. To be honest, it, it's not a good matchup. Uh, I guess uh, you know from the Scoop Squad. I actually got the easiest matchup, which is Zengif, and and it's also hard. So, yeah, I, I wasn't expecting uh, any of the able players to get past first round because of that, because of how difficult the first match was going to be. Okay, well, we have a couple of questions. One from a tweet uh, that wants to know, what is your next tournament? And you can just answer that uh, as quickly as you as you like. And the second question is coming from the chat uh, from Play Vinyl. And he wants to ask about the Xian match. What can you tell us about that Xian match that you had? Uh, all right, uh, the Xian match first. Then uh, I actually forgot the first question. The first already, question was, "What's yeah. your next tournament?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, next tournament. I'm not too sure about about it right now. Uh, really depends if uh, there's going to be SF4 tournament. Uh, I got to prepare for uh, SF5. I don't really know how to play the game yet. I didn't have any. I I try to play like a, a little bit, a little tournament. Uh, that we that we have on PSX this weekend. I got bodied by a bicep player. Didn't even know what what was going on. So I <laughs> have a lot a lot of work to do uh, in SF5. That's gonna take a lot of time. Uh, I'm planning to go to the final round, but I'm not too sure yet. Okay, so you want to get that uh, sink your teeth into that first CPT event? Yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, Zian, tell us about your match yeah. with Zian. The match, uh, the match against Yen um, was actually I, I, I really enjoyed the match. Uh, it was it was a good match. I I actually think I had it to a point, but I made some uh, I made a crucial mistake like twice. Uh, you know, uh, I started getting too offensive when I was up two one. Uh, I got too greedy to be honest. Um, I could I could finish the match by doing a, like a EX CLT into Ultra when I when I was like uh, two one match point. Um, he was starting neutral jumping in the corner. I was looking for that actually. That was like the fourth or fifth time he, he did a neutral jump in the corner. Uh, for some reason, I was I was not thinking about EX chain of direction into Ultra. I was just uh, pretty confident about EX Skyfall hitting me. Uh, hit him in for th that uh, particular situation. So uh, I miscalculated the, the, the range and I got punished by that. And, uh, Zian, uh, of course, a strong player, he used to that, all the pressure, uh, he knows 
how to how to clutch you know uh, he, he just uh, clutched it out from from there uh i had another opportunity uh where i got too greedy and went for a unnecessary to nail throw he was like full super and full ultra uh he punished me for that and he got the yoki i tried to do the x chain direction for the armor cancel roll but i missed the input and i actually uh um uh, uh, got hit by uh, a jumping attack. I was crouching because I missed the input, and that was it. You know, I just lost in those two two moments. I just had the opportunity to to close it out, and I I wasn't. Uh, I I think I wasn't strong enough to to close it out. That's yeah, I I noticed the the missed ex falling sky, and I noticed for snake eyes, you mistimed a couple close standing fierce anti airs on his neutral jumps. Would you boil that down to nerves, or or what would you say factored into these these big drops that honestly could have brought you further in the tournament? Uh, yeah, uh, about the close fears, it really depends because uh, there's a uh, there's something a lot of players don't know about uh, right now is that uh, if you jump against uh, if you neutral jump on able uh, and you don't press anything, you do a neutral jump empty jump. Uh, if the able player pr uh, presses standing fierce, you know, for the close fierce anti uh it actually whiffs. It really depends on the opponent's timing. So if you don't press anything, it's harder to anti air. Uh, you gotta delay it just because the uh, your opponent uh, did uh, an empty jump, uh, not even neutral jump. If you if you jump uh, jump straight forward uh, in front of able, you do stand fierce. It's gonna whiff. A lot of players still don't know about that. Uh, because Snake Eyes uh, tends to press buttons later when he's jumping. Uh, I reacted too fast in a couple moments and my stand fear with because of that. Uh, about another uh, execution error that actually happened against Itabashi, which was a uh, low fear into ultra. That was like really, really bad, a really bad mistake. I just pressed uh, three punches uh, too early uh, and that was it. I, uh, for for execution mistakes, I think that was it. The uh, skyfall against the end was not a, an execution error. It was just a bad decision. Kelma, we actually have some clips that our producer Ray uh, prepared for you. It's these are you know one of the big storylines was that you beat Snake Eyes in the first match, and then he comes back and he wins the run back. Uh, so the questions are, are specifically from that second Snake Eyes match, and we're going to go into our first clip. Will, if you could roll that, please. You like to use the wheel kick and EX changer's direction in the matchup versus Zangief. Can you explain why these are helpful tools in this matchup? Were you able to hear that, Kioma? Uh, no, I couldn't hear anything. Uh, Will, would you cut to Ray? Ray, what, was your, what, what were you trying to put up there uh, for us to hear? All right, so... A beautiful scene there, by the way, with the snowflakes <laughs> yeah, it's falling. Really, it's really, really cold out here. <laughs> oh, what was that first clip about? All right, so we know that you like to use wheel kick, you know, in this footy matchup against Zankeef. Can you talk a little bit about using wheel kick and EX change of direction for anti air? Uh, EX change of direction for anti air uh, is to to try to get the juggle for the ultra or EX falling sky afterwards. Uh, sometimes it's safer than doing a uh, like low forward or low fierce anti airs. Uh, the thing about Zankeef is that uh, if he presses like uh, jumping fierce or jumping forward, it actually, it's a different timing. So if he presses uh, jumping forward early, uh, my low fierce is going to be uh, beat. You know, right there, I just wanted uh, some counter potential, some damage and the knockdown, of course. Uh, but that, was, that wasn't that was actually optimal. Uh, I could just try to play the neutral a little bit more. But... Yeah, I was. I, I got to the point that I thought I really needed some damage and the knockdown right away, and tried to go some for some Oki attempts, because momentum is so so strong in this matchup. Yeah, and then I also noticed that you like to use wheel kicks a lot for the footsie game, or is it, or is that to whiff punish? Um, the thing I guess uh, about wheel kick is that a properly spaced uh, Zangief can cannot do much. It's like uh. If you get it max range, you can't even uh, stay strong, which is a four frame move. Uh, actually, the wheel kick, when you do it like uh, almost like uh, the last second frames, it's some, 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 something like uh, minus five, minus four. But because of the range, you can't punish it. So uh, perfectly spaced wheel kick is actually good. 
If I whiff, then it's bad because he has standing roundhouse and all those punish like stand short, the X three hand. If he had red focus and it's just over, you know. But wheel kick is important in that matchup. You mentioned that you didn't necessarily have to anti him with the EX change of direction. Uh, with meter being such a part of Abel's game, I mean, he uses it for his combos, he uses it for his anti airs, for his reversals. Do you often purposely save the meter in a situation where you could get, you know, an anti air just to make sure you have the damage for later? Uh, yeah, correct. But the thing is, uh, sometimes you, of course, all the Abel players want to do that damage, though, uh, that uh, 365 damage with a step kick combo, but it's not easy to land a step kick against Sengi. Uh, because every time he does standing strong, for example, uh, if you just press the button and you do like a forward kick right away, uh, at the same time, actually, uh, uh, his uh, standing strong will uh, make the, the, the staff kick with. So the range is kind of different. You've got to be prepared for uh, walking a little bit closer, actually in, in the uh, standing strong range to do a staff kick, and it's not too good, to be honest. Um, step kick situation, block step kick. It's like uh, if you don't get a frame perfect grab, uh, a frame perfect throw uh, after the block step kick, things could be bad. You know, he could uh, yeah, uh, SPD, he could uh, backdash into uh, SPD actually. Uh, TT after block step kick is also bad. So the thing is, uh, for combo potential, uh, it it's good, but you don't, you know. You don't have many chances to land uh, high damage combos against Sengif. We have another clip, and this is a uh, somewhat explosive play on your part. Uh, Ray, if you would live commentate this next uh, clip of yours that you picked. All right. So you're down 0-2. You're at a considerably less amount of health than your opponent. Yet you make this amazing comeback, and you're constantly backdashing so that green hand whiffs, and then you option select at the end. Just walk us through what's your game plan and how you made these decisions. Um, the thing is, um, uh, of course, Neka is going for chip damage in that situation. So it was just about uh, getting a good read and, uh, and uh, making him w uh, just with the green hand for the punish. That's what, uh, that's what I was aiming at uh, back then. Uh, the first, uh, the first knockdown when I got the backdash into the green hand, I wasn't really expecting him to to do green hand. You know, that was kind of risky to be honest. But at the second situation on neutral, nobody nobody is able to react to a green hand in that situation. So you just have to guess. I just uh, got the perfect moment. You know, I I walked forward a little bit, uh, tried to make him uh, do the green hand. And so the, the bait actually paid out. For the last knockdown, uh, the jumping medium kick wasn't actually going to hit. Uh, I make that whiff on purpose, so that's not actually uh, an option side. It's just, it's just a, a whiff jumping forward into a tornado throw, because if he does anything that's a midi tornado throw, and you're going to get hit. And so you knew that that would beat the, the EX green hand there? That would be everything he did except for jumping and backdashing. So if he did ultra, lariat, uh, green hand, EX, green hand, doesn't matter. Everything he tried to do on reversal would get hit by the tornado throw. That's why. Okay, Mama, unfortunately, we have run out of time for this interview, but I have one final question for you, and it is this. Who are you going to use in Street Fighter V? Right now, I'm confident about Karen and Laura, but I didn't have the opportunity to play Laura yet. Um, so just be, based not, on the fact yeah. that she's from Brazil, you're going to use her? Uh, no, no. Uh, I heard from a lot of players that uh, her play style is somewhat similar to Abel. I didn't have the opportunity to test her yet, but maybe next, next week, you know, when the third beta comes out, and then I'll get the opportunity to see what she's made of. Okay, I really want to thank you for taking the time. Coming to us live all the way from Brazil after an arduous weekend and a couple days of traveling. Thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, well, thank you for having me. All right. Well, we'll hopefully get to talk to him here in the future when he comes back, maybe after final round. But now we're going to move on to our news section where we bring in our panelists. Ace King Off Suit, also known as Steven Jurek, or that should probably be the other way around, who writes for the Daily Dot, and John Velociraptor Guerrero. As we get him uh, queued up on Skype, what do you think of Keoma Pacheco, man? 
You know, it always surprised me when someone's like, you know, yeah, I, I happened to make it this far in the tournament. Because <laughs> you kind of think of those guys as the super confident ones. But no, I mean, he's just an amazing player who studied up. And instead of being overly confident he was going to win, he just prepared to win. And he, before the interview, he was telling us, I thought I was going to be one of those 0-2 boys. Oh, yeah. That was his, his sole goal, he said. But, I mean, he obviously way surpassed that. I wonder if uh, having beat um, Snake Eyes that first match really gave him that confidence. He was like, wait a second. I can do this. I mean, it's crazy looking back, honestly, because he got seventh, but he only lost 3-2 to Shan and Snake Eyes. Uh, and he was extremely close overall to, to making it even further in the tournament. So I'm really excited to do see what he can do, not only in Street Fighter V, but in what little Street Fighter Four tournaments there may be left. All right. If I'm not mistaken, we are joined now by our panelists, John and Steve. Welcome, guys. Hey, what's up, guys? What's uh, up? John, uh, you were actually at Capcom Cup, you lucky dog. Tell us what the energy in the room was like. Uh, okay, so there was the PlayStation experience, and that was at least two levels of, of insane video game amazingness. And then on the third <laughs> level was the, uh, the big auditorium where they were holding panels, and then they also had the PlayStation experience. I'm sorry, then they also had Capcom Cup. When you went in there, it was... To anyone that's been to Evo, it was like the size of an Evo ballroom, perhaps even bigger. And it was just filled with seats. And then there's this amazingly, uh, this huge, like, uh, display on the on the stage with, uh, I mean, you guys would have seen it had you watched the, the live stream. But mm -hmm. to be there, to see, like, these silhouettes pop up and then these, like, garage door opener things just <laughs> fly up and Bon Chan standing there and Daigo standing there, it was, uh, it really made me feel like we are on, on the way to that League of Legends status. Bro, that just say it. We esports. <laughs> all right. All right. We esports now. <laughs> no, it was, it was an incredible experience. I'll take that with me for the rest of my life. No matter how much bigger these things get, that was a mile marker. That was... Uh, that was a, a great time. <laughs> well, we'll definitely be able to talk to uh, Matt Dahlgren later in the show when we interview him um, about the production value and everything that went into it. Ray, if you would, what was the prize pool breakdown for this tournament? All right, so at Capcom Cup, Kazunoko walked away with a whopping $120,000. Daigo Umehara took $60,000. And third place, Jin, also walked away with $25,000. And this is an incredible amount. But for fifth place tied, we have Snake Eyes, oh, sorry, Punko, don't forget him, walked away with 15,000. Snake Eyes and Mise both walked away with 10,000. And Infiltration and Kimoma both walked away with $5,000. So that's a ton of money for a uh, Street Fighter tournament. It's certainly a lot more. I'm glad the prize pot got split a little further. Yeah, I mean... Um We've, we've been kind of doing this, you know, first, second, third, 70, 20, 10 thing for a long time. And certainly with, you know, $250,000, it was time to, to spread the love a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, what did you, what, what, I want to talk about takeaways. I mean, there was a lot of cool action, of course. Um, but what were, what were some of those moments that stick with you, Steve? For me, it was just the amount of incredible play throughout the day. Um, we had another one of those sets between uh, Jen and Kioma. I can't say Shen's name for some reason. <laughs> you just said it no, there, man. <laughs> <laughs> but another one of those sets that's just incredible. Uh, Going to go down as one of the greatest of all time. Uh, I also love watching just how dominant Kazunoko was against some of the best players in the world. I mean, he took like 14 straight rounds. He's 6-0 he's Daigo. He's 6-0 Mise. It was just incredible watching him work and just go to town, not just in general, but against the best players in the world. Just seeing the level he was playing at was incredible. The incredible was the word you were using to describe it, right, Danka? To be honest, I mean, for me, Capcom Cup was exciting in the sense that it was the best Street Fighter Four players, but it showed a side of the game that I don't personally love. I've never been the biggest fan of the game. And you saw Kazunoko dominate the tournament with Wake Up Jab versus Wake Up DP. And honestly, to me, it seems like Street Fighter 4 has gotten to a point where blocking is, like, such a horrible option. And maybe I'm the only one who felt that way, but, but Break that apart a little bit, because Hamad said that the new Japanese tech was don't block. But what does that mean? Blo the, the thing about Street Fighter 4 is that most moves are plus on block that you would use in a block string. So it, things just reset themselves so easily. And there's rarely a point to get out that doesn't involve DPing or mashing jab. And I understand that, that makes it like a proactive game. Defense has to be proactive. 
But I mean, just the way that Kazunoko picked apart Strider with wake up jab to me was just like mind blowing from a fighting game because that's typically kind of a, a high risk, low reward option in, in anything else that I've played. John, what was the 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 the, the temperature in the room for grand finals when? It, it looked like oh, everybody wanted Daigo to kind of make a comeback, and it didn't really happen. What, what was the room like at that moment? There was a moment of hope uh, for, I guess you would say, the Daigo fanboys. This, we were coming from a point where everyone was talking about it. Kazunoko had 7-0 Daigo at Topanga, and then he had just 3-0 Daigo in their winner's bracket. So he was at 10-0, right? And he's going for the, uh, <laughs> the perfect legend. Uh, <laughs> And I love like, that that's a thing now, by the way. <laughs> there's no way Daigo's going to get 13 and owed, is there? And we saw him trying to make these adjustments with his jumping jabs and jumping normals, and they were kind of sort of working, but not obviously not enough to, to take away entire rounds. Um, but then Daigo turned it on. He did his Daigo thing, and everybody expected that because, I mean, that's what the guy is known for, right? So suddenly he starts he, – we see a new life in him, and it's not going to be – he takes a game, and we're like, okay, phew, it's not going to be 13-0, but is there going to be enough? And I couldn't tell you the exact moment that happened. I, I don't recall the set off the top of my head, but the, the final couple of games – Every eye, even more so than throughout the rest of the day, the day started with like the 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 stadium or the the seating was just like a third full. But at the end of the day, everyone was there and every single eye was on that main screen. No one was looking through their their bag. No one was on their phone. Everyone was just on there because it was the final moments of Street Fighter Four. And what a Cinderella story it was going to be either way. Mm. Uh, but but no, we all like. It was not a giveaway at the end there. It was everyone on the edge of their seats wanting to see Daigo take it. But then there was also a part of us that were like, yeah, it'd be cool if Kazunoko won too. And we were all just this huge emotional mess. And then it ended. And uh, chaos. It was great. It was a good time. <laughs> uh, Ray, would you be so kind enough to remind us who were those 0-2 boys? Well, sadly, Justin Wong, 0-2. RB, as well as Gact. We have Dark Gioa. And surprisingly, in my opinion, Nemo. That was a really surprising one. Bonchan, 801 Strider, and Diminion. Yeah, how do you feel about that? I mean, I didn't ask you, John, actually. What was your, uh, I mean, we were talking about some of the moments, but what was your favorite moment of, of Capcom Cup? And then we'll move uh, on to a character that was revealed over the weekend as well. Yeah. The first thing that comes to my mind was when Daigo was playing Infiltration, and he made that ridiculous, ridiculous comeback that ended with, a, I believe it was an EX axe kick, and, and the whole place just lost it. It was, it was amazing. And so off the top of my head, that had to be the biggest moment for me. I mean, you might go into a couple of others that had more, I don't know, pizzazz in one way or another, but that was the moment that I'll probably remember as the, uh, the highlight of Capcom Cup for me. Okay, um, we're going to talk more Capcom Cup with Matt, so we're going to leave it there. We already had Kaoma, and we talked a lot about Capcom Cup there. Let's talk about Fong, if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, this gentleman here behind me, creepy dude, has he taken Sagat's place? It looked like he has in the, uh, in the stage. We talked a little bit about him on our Capcom Cup special that we did on Saturday. General thoughts on Fong? I mean, Go ahead. to me... To me Fong represents something that wasn't in the game, which is a goofier fireball. I guess we have Dalsim throws, you know, his angled fireballs. We have Ryu and Ken and Chun-Li with kind of standard fireballs. But they had kind of not put in a more traditional zoner in the game as of yet. And people have been complaining about the fact that so many characters had anti-fireball moves. So I think seeing his, you know, like double fireball tactics, his shield that he has is his V skill, and then his V trigger, which we haven't seen much of, is a welcome addition to people who wanted to play the game a little bit slower, not that we know exactly what he plays like yet, but it gives us another option outside of, you know, just pick Dalsim. You know, you had mentioned the, his ultra doesn't have, like, an animation on it. I saw another cut of it, and it does start with an animation and then goes directly into that flappy thing and it ends. I, mean, I, I don't really think know very little about the move, yeah. But. I've heard about it unofficially. Um, so... I, and none of this is backed up by any kind of documented science or textbooks or anything like that, <laughs> but... Uh, what I've heard, just the, the speculation from around in the San Francisco area, was that it's an ultra similar, uh, I'm sorry, not an ultra, it's his super, his critical art, right? Where he flies, 
Yeah. It's similar to uh, T-Hawk's Ultra 2 right now in that it attacks upwards and, and is an anti-air. Then he flies and he can actually come down and cross up later on. Oh. Again, none of that has come from Capcom. That's just what I've heard buzzing around. Take it as you will. But uh, along those same lines, I've also heard that right now, as a character, he is ridiculous. Like He is super overpowered and, uh, and a glass cannon. So. I can dig it. You like that kind of guy, right? You like that poison that he puts on the ground? I think he's cool for sure. I mean, he, he's not Vega yet, but no one is. <laughs> um, any other thoughts on this Street Fighter V character? Because now we know the full roster. And they, of course, came out and admitted uh, or, or, or revealed what we already had, had spoiled for us, which was the rest of the DLC characters. You guys ready for Street Fighter V? Absolutely. And as like a zoning go Kenny kind of player, I'm really looking at Fang uh, because if, if he is kind of like what we're hearing, then I think he'll be a lot of fun and he might fit my style. And I don't have a character yet and I'm kind of having this crisis about that and some anxiety. So he's kind of hope on the horizon for me. <laughs> um, I, go ahead, Steve. I, what you got? Yeah, I, I don't know if I like the character yet, but I like that he exists. I'm glad that he is sort of so far in from left field as compared to everybody else. It just, you know, that's just something that could bring in more players or at least add a little something to the game that maybe we didn't have in, uh, in four. My, my question is what they're going to reveal at this point. I mean, the game's obviously soon on the horizon. The last beta is coming up this month. But I just wonder where they have to go in between now and February at this point. Yo, story mode. Story, story mode? mode? It's got to be. And... And we're expecting, okay, we've talked about this a little bit before, but what like NRS has done with story mode and, and a couple of other fighters and how Street Fighter has not always had the, the best track record with paying attention to its story. You know, like there's, there's, the game is successful enough that we're always talking about the story and trying to piece it together. But it, it's always been just kind of like side cut animations, maybe single screenshots with some words on it and never super in depth. And I think this time around, they know that the, the players really want that. And I think that they've been saving this reveal uh, to be a really, really big one as their last hurrah before the actual game comes out. That's all. That's, that's, it's got to be, right? Because like, that's really all we have left. And I think that's kind of the point Doc was starting to make there. With all the characters revealed, what's left besides stuff like the story? All right, guys. Uh, we are running a little bit late on time because we want to get to our Matt Dahlgren interview. I don't want to keep him too late. Um, but... Uh, Steve, you had a final thought on one of the announcements that was made at the end of Capcom Cup. Yeah, um, everyone caught that Capcom Cup was returning, obviously. Uh, Pro Tour, they announced that they would have another, a baseline prize pool of $500,000. Baseline is the key word in that. I heard because it. Because to me, that opens up the possibility of maybe some of the things we've seen out of KI with... Uh, uh, skin sales. Uh, and they did that for Mortal Kombat as well, right? If you bought that, that one Sub-Zero Kombat. skin, and it resulted in a ton of money for that tournament series. Yeah, and I'm wondering if that's why they specifically use the word baseline to leave the door open for some way for players, for, for us to help grow those pots. Hey, Steve. I will ask Matt in about 10 minutes. That Although, very I would like to say that that's been kind of a... It hasn't been official from, from Nintendo themselves, but these whole crowdfunding things have become a big source of contention in the Smash community, actually. Really? And where the money go towards and why they need that much. I think if it's official from Capcom, it'll be a lot less controversial as opposed to tournament organizers doing it, but something to think about. Absolutely. Gentlemen, unfortunately, we have run out of time. There was a little bit more news. The King of Fighters looks a lot better. The King of Fighters 14. Uh, there's also a Steam sale for some People of these Arxis games. People said it's really fun, the King of Fighters it 14. It looks good. This new trailer People, looks I know good. the trailer, and, and the game still kind of looks like garbage. Like, there's no, there's no denying the graphics are not good. But I have heard from, from somewhat reliable sources, in my opinion, that the game is shaping up pretty well. And for the people that liked, you know, the older style KOS a little more, 98, 2002, it's, it's a little more along those lines than 13. Well, uh, Ray, did we miss any other important bits of uh, information that you wanted to share? Well, as we know, the true winner of Capcom Cup is E.G. Momochi, who is on course to marry Choco Maka. About time, right? I mean, come on. Congratulations to Momochi and to Choco Blanca. All right, guys. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, we'll see you next week. We're going to let you go because you're getting bumped from Matt Dahlgren. <laughs>
Thank you, John. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Uh, while we get Matt Dahlgren on the line, tell who, who, what did you hear about King of Fires? Let's, let's talk a little bit more about that while we uh, while we wait for. I mean, some people got to play it at the PlayStation Experience. I believe they only had like five or six characters available, and, and yes, the animations are still a little bit janky. It's looking better. It's looking better. The animations are a little bit janky still. However, I think if they can get the online right, which KOF 13s was horribly wrong. And in my opinion, dial down HD combos and that type of stuff, obviously HD isn't in the game a little bit. You're going to get a lot of people back into the game. Because KOF's always been a very deep game that was kind of pick up and play. And I think HD hurt that a little bit. And what I've heard is that it's, it's changing for the, uh, for the better. So since we're talking about King of Fighters, let's bring on Matt Dahlgren, who has nothing to do with that game. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us. On, as Donka likes to remind me, this little web show, Best of Three. Uh, no problem. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Matt, have you recovered from what I imagine was a pretty intense weekend and build up to that weekend as well? Uh, I, can't, I can't say I've fully recovered just yet. I'm definitely looking forward to the holiday break. Um, I did take most of yesterday off, uh, and I feel a lot better today than I did Monday for sure. Well, you know, I want to start off the interview with this. It was a crazy weekend, a lot of action. What was your favorite moment of Sunday? Uh, basically, anything that had to do with Kiyoma. Uh, I thought he had a big <laughs> run, and he was easily the, the biggest talking point, in my opinion, throughout the whole tournament. We had, a, we had a tour this year that was completely dominated by Japan for the most part. Uh, and to have the sole Brazilian player make such a big stir in the tournament, I thought it was absolutely awesome. So, so when you have these Capcom Pro Tour events across the country, and we talked about this on the show with other guests, and they're in these different countries, is it is it nice as part of Capcom to see someone you know from Brazil make it out of the Brazilian qualifier and to get some more of that you know World Warrior feel going on? Oh, totally. And we actually put a lot of effort to try to balance out each of the regions. Uh, it was kind of ironic this year. It was like our first year doing the Capcom Pro Tour. We pretty much were all inclusive and just partnered up with as many events as possible. And we didn't even try to balance it per region. Uh, this year, we put a lot of effort to make sure that like North America, Europe, and Asia all had the same amount of ranking points that were available. Uh, and it went the exact opposite. It was like basically Asia swept everything. So it wasn't as global as it was before but um yeah we definitely want to have a lot of representation from each of the regions i know the fans in brazil are extremely passionate um so i was very 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 happy to see kiyomo go on a go on a big run you know on that cpt brazil event it sounded like combo fiend could not get enough of kiyomo he was really loving it uh, he was sounded like his number one fan did he infect the rest of the uh, of this esports production team there at capcom um well just brazil as a whole um, I think even back on the SF25 series when Breno Fighters won, that was like one of our favorite clips. Like they hoisted him on their shoulders and they were just so – that, that, whole, that whole community down there is just so passionate about the game um, that we're definitely rooting for them. They're, they're clearly the underdogs, um, so very, very happy to have a strong representation from them. Did you expect the Pro Tour to be such a big deal this year? I mean, there were people traveling at last second across the country just to qualify for last thing. You had, you know, the sob story with Ryan Hart just barely not making it after entering all those events. How did you feel about how not just the Cup, but the Tour leading up to it went this season? Um, we're, we're very, very proud on how the Capcom Pro Tour did this season. I think across the board, we saw pretty much awesome growth. I think almost all of our metrics pretty much doubled in size. Um, we knew that the prize money going up so drastically compared to the previous year was definitely going to mix things up. And I think it definitely put the travel into the next gear. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I think Asia dominated so much is there was so much more of an incentive this year to travel. Um, in my opinion, I still think we're just getting started. Uh, I think we have plenty of room to grow. But uh, at the conclusion of each season, we, we all are pretty, pretty proud with what we've accomplished thus far. The conclusion of this season is unique in that it's arguably the end of the Street Fighter IV lifespan as we know it. How do you guys there on that team feel about that, considering that the last time I spoke to you was at EVO, and you guys were talking about how much it had meant to you guys when that Event Hubs poll came out, saying that this was the most balanced game, the most fun version of Street Fighter IV, and now we're saying goodbye to it. I mean, how do you guys feel about that? 
Um, always, always sad to see. Well, it's not necessarily going. I'm pretty sure that the community itself will continue to run tournaments on it, and there's still going to be some awesome events focused on it. Um, but yeah, Street Fighter Four definitely has a very uh, firm place in all of our hearts. It's done so much for the fighting game scene as a whole. Uh, I thought we had a pretty nice tribute to it uh, at the Capcom Cup. Uh, with that said, I think Street Fighter V is really where we get to take things to the next level. I think it's going to bring in a huge influx of brand new players. Um, and I think it's going to unlock uh, a lot of doors to, to some pretty awesome opportunities in the future. So I'm I'm pretty excited for the transition myself. Well, we definitely have a couple of Street Fighter V questions for you, but uh, we'll get to them in a second. Uh, I want to know, will we see any more support in the Capcom Pro Tour specifically for Street Fighter IV? So right now we're, we plan on just focusing on Street Fighter V. Uh, we have a pretty lean team, uh, and to double up on our production capabilities is pretty tough for us. Uh, and we've got a lot riding on the success of Street Fighter V, so that's where our focus is going to be moving forward. And then uh, right before this, we talked about how we heard 500,000 as a baseline. Can you possibly elaborate on that? Uh, I don't have specifics to share. Uh, we do have ideas on how to potentially grow that over time. It's actually uh, this week and the next week over here is when we're formulating our plans for the next season. Uh, so we're, we're discussing a lot of different options on what we could do there. Uh, but I do think we're basically ensuring that there's going to be at least a half million dollars of prizing and hopefully we can implement some tactics to grow that as well. But do you feel, I mean, obviously I'm glad to hear you say that, but do you, do you feel like, come on guys, when people get angry that you only said 500 K? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I get what they're comparing us to. I mean, if you, if you compare the prize pools for the fighting game scene to like, I don't know, a Dota or a League of Legends, uh, we still have some ways to go, but at, at the same time, it is a pretty, pretty tremendous increase from what we had historically. Um, but I want the fans to keep pushing on us. I think we, I think we can do better. Um, I'm not satisfied myself, so I don't expect our fans to be satisfied. Uh, and I think in the next two to three years, we're going to see some pretty awesome prize pools. We look forward to that. Um, yeah. <laughs> what kind of? Because uh, you know, I'm hearing guys that that, that had already sworn off Street Fighter Four. Guys like Donka who are like, it's not my favorite game, talking about, okay, time to crack my knuckles because Street Fighter V is coming out and get back in the lab. What, uh, you know, your wildest dreams, what are you expecting for next year? Uh, just massive growth across the board. I want to see a bunch of new players on the scene, people that have never played Street Fighter, uh, Street Fighter before getting into the mix and really trying to give, give a big go at it. I want to see our stream numbers go up, um, and it's going to be super exciting. I mean, people are going to be learning all the time. Uh, we're constantly going to be developing the game post-launch and adding new content, adding new characters as things go on. Um, so I, I expect a lot, and I, I really hope that we basically grow massively over the next two to three years. Mm -hmm. Ono came out and said uh, a couple days ago, I believe, that they're trying to bridge the gap between you know, the, the experts and the new players by kind of erasing what they already knew with Street Fighter V. And there's been some backlash in the competitive community for that. What would you have to say to people who are worried about Street Fighter V? Um, I would say stick with us. As a, as a platform, we're not going anywhere. We're going to be listening to the fans' feedback uh, constantly, and the game is going to evolve. If you look at the first iteration of Street Fighter IV and you look at where Ultra Street Fighter IV is today, there's a, there's a big evolution on how that game developed over time. Uh, I think you can expect the same from Street Fighter V. And then also, making the game accessible is good for everybody involved. The more players that get into the scene, um, that, that spurs that growth. Uh, so if we want to see those big prize pools, you get to those big prize pools by getting all of these new players into the scene and by achieving that growth. Um, so like, stick with us, be open-minded. Uh, the game itself, I do not think is too simple uh, and we're not done yet. We still are, we still are tweaking it. Um, and I'm, we're very confident in the product and w what we think we can accomplish with this product. Speaking of the product, you guys announced Fong. We're fans of Fong here on the show. Uh, what can you tell us about that character? Considering that in his stage, where Sagat should be in the background, it's his face. Where's Sagat, first of all? Well, I mean, I can't, I can't spill any story details. You'll have to play the game itself to find out exactly what happened. He is a high-ranking official uh, in Shadowloo. 
Um, I think he's a he's a cool addition to the cast. He's unlike any character we've had before. We've never had a poison based character, uh, and I think he he definitely has his own unique style that you haven't seen before in Street Fighter. How does that poison work? You touch it and you start losing life over time, or or, or what can you tell us about some of those intricate? I know Combo Fiend is the nitty gritty guy, but I'm yeah. sure you've been living this for a yeah. while now. Yeah, so, um, yeah, basically he can do uh, poisonous damage. Uh, it will be recoverable over time, kind of like uh, how we, we handle chip damage. Um, I don't have the in-depth strategies just yet, um, but uh, I think he's going to be an awesome addition to the cast. So I have a question that might be a little slightly controversial, but um, the changes that were made to Armika, uh, her animation where she spanks her butt, and uh, the intro for Kami... There was a lot of controversy. So people on both sides of the argument saying this is censorship. We're very upset by this. I'd like to hear it from the horse's mouth. What spurred that decision and how did you guys feel having to make it? So, well, first off, it's a product still in development. So Mm -hmm. the game is constantly being tweaked over time and we're not finished 100% just yet. Uh, And we are a teen rated franchise. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we keep that appeal to a very wide audience um, we thought maybe in those instances things could have been pushed just a little bit too far, so we had to tone it down just slightly. Uh, but we want to make sure that Street Fighter remains a family-friendly franchise, uh, and it's just that delicate balance that we play, uh, ensuring that we remain a team game. Thank you for answering that question. That seems like a perfectly legitimate response to that, and and what most of us assume, to be honest. Um, there was something you guys mentioned at the end of that stream about hiring a ton of people to help with Street Fighter V. Can you elaborate on that or, or, or shed some more details on that? Yeah. Uh, so primarily, mo- most of the spots are going to be over at Japan. I know that they we have we expect a very bright future for Street Fighter. I know we're doubling down on the product, so there's going to be a lot of positions over there opening up. Uh, I don't have specifics just yet on on the positions over here. I think there should be a few. Um, but definitely stay tuned for more details. There are, there are job opportunities at Capcom in the near future for sure. But I mean, is that, uh, QA, is that, uh, community outreach? I mean, what, what, what kind of give us a little bit of a sense of what these positions actually are? Yeah. So, well, over in Japan, it's primarily going to be development related, um, over here, I do believe we are going to be building, um, like a, a server team or someone, something to do more with the networking aspect of Street Fighter. Uh, our marketing team itself isn't uh, isn't expanding on Street Fighter internally in the near future. We've got a pretty strong team, uh, but with that said, with the Capcom Pro Tour, uh, we work with a lot of people from the FGC. And and one of one of the things that we really look to do is to is to try to reward the the fans that have been putting in the time and effort over like. And they've been in it for the long haul. Uh, so if you can't get into Capcom directly, uh, we still would want to talk to you if you've got ideas of what you'd like to see on the CPT um, or if you have skills that can be brought to the table. We're, we're always looking for new um, outsourced partners to be able to help us uh, grow the tour. You know, um, you guys made some announcements on how getting new characters is going to roll out with the Zenny, and uh, you can also buy a season pass, which I think some people also were expecting, and it seems in line with what you had been building us up towards. And that's kind of falling into that uh, esports model, if you will, where the characters get released, you can earn them or you can buy them. So that, uh, I think, is tapping into that esports angle that Street Fighter V has going on, but that's not the esports stuff I want to talk about. Capcom, right. Capcom Cup itself, the venue was gorgeous. The intro was cool. Bringing out the players had a lot of uh, production value. Uh, you had the analyst desk with Mike Ross, Gutex, and Combo Fiend. How important to you guys is that production side of what we know as, you know, quote unquote, esports? Um, it's definitely important. And I think what you saw was the first taste of what this Sony partnership really means. Um, being able to collaborate uh, with an event such as PlayStation Experience and being able to utilize the stage that they built they built for the keynote um, definitely pushed things into uh, to the next level in terms of what we could do uh, production wise. Uh, we also are listening. So last year, people weren't too fond of the of the live music during Capcom Cup. So we decided <laughs> to keep it all game gameplay oriented. So 
that's where you got the analyst desk. And I think that's something that um, other esports franchises have been doing well that we haven't necessarily had for fighting games. So we felt like it was an it was an appropriate thing to do. Um, one of the things I really liked this year was the uh, was how we handled the brackets on the stream and live in person at the event. Um, I felt like that was something that was kind of lacking from from events in the past. Uh, but uh, Nidell is really great at what he does. Um, we we like to see what he comes up with, and we're always looking for any sort of improvements we can make to the tour. Do you have a question? I was just wondering. I'll, I'll, a few people had comments. I'm not sure if this is exactly you know your field about how the, the beginning of the tournament was two out of three as opposed to three out of five, and that it was all on Sunday. Is there a particular reason behind that? And how do you feel about the players who may have, you know, not gotten the three out of five opportunity? Yeah, I mean, that had to do with just us trying to fit everything into a single day. I mean, when you work, so this time around, it was not a standalone event. So we are collaborating with an event. Uh, we were collaborating with PSX. Uh, they had the keynote the previous day. So and they also had other content for uh, other franchises that ne they needed to focus on as well. So. We were very grateful for Sony to be able to give us all day Sunday. I think we did the best with the time that we had allotted. Uh, we know players are interested in longer sets. Um, so we tried to strike a better balance this year than we than we had last year. Um, but that was just uh, a result of trying to do everything in one day. Matt, we're unfortunately running out of time. I do have one more question for you, and it has to do with next year's potential for online tournaments. Can you give us a tease on what we might be able to expect for online tournaments? So... We definitely want to have an online component of the Capcom Pro Tour. We, we actually don't have those details hammered out just yet, so I have nothing to announce. Um, that's actually the main one of the main topics we have within the next two weeks is how to finalize that. Uh, but I can definitely say you can look forward to having an online component to the Capcom Pro Tour. And everyone internally here believes that online is probably the most critical factor in the success of the product. That's why we have all of these beta tests that we're running. Um, and you should see an increased focus on how we handle online play in the future. Anything else that we didn't ask about that you could tease us with or, or, or clue us in on here now since we have you before we let you go? Um, uh, well, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, think, I think you were pretty comprehensive. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm good on my end. All right, Matt, thank you so much. Uh, clearly, you're a very busy guy, and uh, really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us on the show. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on the show. Good appreciate luck, man. It. Thank you, Matt. Have a good one. And thank you guys for watching Best of Three.